In this video, we're actually going to shift gears and start talking about descriptive research, which is one part of our quantitative research component. The idea now is that we're going to be collecting data that describes an environment, and this is in contrast to causal research, which is where we're trying to make causal statements like something causes something else. That'll be the subject of the next video. So there are countless ways in which we can use descriptive research, and I'll just highlight a few of them so you get a flavor of what this type of data can be used for, and I'll also highlight specific business applications where these data can be used. Now, the first is actually to understand a competitive environment, and there are a number of ways we can do even that. So I'll start by talking about survey data and contrasting cross-sectional and longitudinal data. Basically, cross-sectional data in a survey context is where we collect data in a snapshot in time from a group of people. And we can do that multiple times, but each time it would be a new group of people and a new snapshot in time. Now, this is contrasted with longitudinal data where we're collecting data over time from the same people. And I want to highlight why this difference is so important and we should be thinking about it when we think about how we collect data. So let's imagine that you're a marketing manager for Verizon and you want to examine the effect of a recent promotion. And the environment that we're living in is you've got some competitors, you've got AT&T, T-Mobile, and Virgin. And you actually ask a very simple question. You go and survey a bunch of people and you ask them who their service provider is. So let's say we ask 500 people. You then run your promotion, you let some reasonable amount of time pass, and then you collect a sample from another 500 people. And the question we want to ask is, does this promotion work? And let's pretend for a second that these are the results that we get. Well, if you quickly eyeball these, you should notice right away that nothing happened. There's been no change across time. And a question I might want to ask you, and you should think about for a moment is, given these data, can we conclude that the promotion was or was not effective? Well, I really hope that you said the answer is, we have no idea. And part of the reason we have no idea is that this is descriptive data. This is data that was captured in a single snapshot in time, admittedly two snapshots in time, and we don't know if any change or lack of change was a result of the promotion or just would have happened anyway. To figure that out, we need to run some sort of experiment, and we'll get to that in the next video. But beyond that, we even have two different groups of people. We're not even sampling the same individuals. What if I asked 500 people in one location and 500 people in a different location, and they were totally different individuals with different likelihoods of being exposed to this promotion, and we can't really compare those two. So as much as cross-sectional data is very useful, and in fact, in this case, it's super useful for understanding things like market share in a particular environment, it's really useless for answering questions like, does a promotion have an effect or not? That is a causal question that we cannot answer with descriptive research. But let's see if we can do a little bit better with longitudinal data. So as a reminder, longitudinal data is where we actually ask the same individuals a question across multiple time periods, as opposed to asking two different groups of people who we'll actually follow people over time. Now, just so you know, the downside of doing this is it's very expensive. Tracking people across time requires a fair bit of resources both to compensate them to be willing to participate in a survey twice across a span of time, and also just tracking those people down and the logistics of all that is in fact expensive. But let's say we do this in the exact same context, and this time I'm going to say we ask a thousand people just to keep our numbers the same, and we're going to say we're going to track these thousand people over time. So again, we'll ask them who their service provider was, have a promotion that runs for some amount of time, and then we'll ask those same thousand people again who their service provider is now. If we do that, we can construct what's called a brand switching matrix or a loyalty matrix, and it looks something like this. The way to read this is that on the right side, you have the totals for how many people were subscribers of each of these service providers prior to the promotion. On the bottom, you have how many people were subscribers following the promotion. In fact, these are the exact same data as we had a moment ago, even though we're actually tracking these people over time. What's new is the inside of this box. The inside is our switching information. And the way to read this is if we pick a number, I like to actually just start by saying that number and I can explain to you what it means. So there were 25 people who were originally Verizon customers, but then became T-Mobile customers. So 25 people switched from Verizon to T-Mobile. We could do that, of course, for any other number. For instance, if we picked out 50, we'd say they were 50 T-Mobile customers who switched to becoming AT&T customers. If we look at the diagonal, that's our loyalty metric. That's the number of people who did not switch. So, for instance, there were 175 Verizon customers who remained Verizon customers. Now, one really useful way to actually look at this is to convert it into percentages, and that's what I'm going to do right here. And what this does is it tells you the degree of loyalty that exists. And again, just to show you how these computations play out, this number 0.125 or 12.5% is just computed simply by taking 25 and dividing it by the total number of people who were Verizon customers beforehand, or 200, and so you get 12.5%. What that means is, of all the Verizon customers, 12.5% of them switched to T-Mobile. As another example, down here we have 0.50 or 50%, and again, the way to compute that is straightforward enough. We say 75 people 
divided by the total number of original Virgin customers, or 150, gets us to 50%. So 50% of Virgin's customers switched to being Verizon customers. And again, just one more example. Over here we have zero, so we just say zero divided by 200 gets us to zero, of course, and that is implying that of the, all the Verizon customers, zero percent, none of them, switched to being Virgin customers. And importantly, those diagonals can now be computed as loyalty percentages. So for instance, for Virgin, we have 36.7%, which is coming from 55 divided by 150, and that's telling us that 36.7% of Virgin's customers remained loyal to Virgin during this time period. And what's really telling about that particular number, that 36.7%, is that if we had done this in a cross-sectional manner like we had previously, we would have concluded that nothing happened for Virgin. Right? There were 150 customers before the promotion, 150 customers after the promotion, and so we'd say nothing occurred. But seeing that inside, seeing that switching behavior, we actually have a much richer understanding. In fact, Virgin churned customers like crazy. They also happen to attract lots of customers. But that's a very expensive business proposition. Churn is expensive, attracting customers is expensive. And so despite the total picture for Virgin looking like nothing happened, actually a lot happened. And so now we could pause for a moment and say, can we answer that original question? Did that promotion work? Now that we can actually track these people over time. Look, Verizon started with 200 customers, ended with 250, and so it seems like that went up. So does the promotion work? Think about that for a second. I hope again you answered, we have no idea. Because despite having more fidelity and knowing who switched where and to, from whom and to whom, we still don't know if the promotion was the cause of that switching behavior or if something else was going on, like maybe the price for Verizon went down or maybe their competitors all went bankrupt or maybe the competitor pricing increased or maybe some of their competitors had celebrity endorsements that just fell apart or maybe any other thing that could have happened that would have explained this difference. We don't know unless we run an experiment. And again, that's the topic for the next video. But we can answer quite a few interesting questions. So for instance, we might want to ask the question of which brand are customers most loyal to? Well, looking back here, it's pretty clearly Verizon with 87.5% loyalty. That's the highest value. How about which brand is most switched to? Looking back at those raw numbers, we can see that Virgin is most switched to. There were a total of 95 people who switched to becoming Virgin customers. And how about the one that was most switched from? Well, it's Virgin again. Looking across horizontally, we see that Virgin lost 95 customers in total, which is the most out of any. So we can still answer a lot of information about the competitive environment that we're dealing with here, if not that actual question that we wanted to answer, which is whether the promotion worked. Now, another way that we can understand the competitive environment is with what's called a market structure analysis. And the best way I know how to explain this was with an example, so let me show that to you now. So let's imagine that we're in the very exciting world of margarine sales. And we want to understand how our consumers actually approach this purchase decision. Now, this is an important decision if you're in this business, so we should take this seriously. And we can actually imagine two approaches for how consumers go about buying margarine. First is what we're going to call the form primary market. The idea here is that consumers, when they decide what to buy, they first decide the form factor, whether it's cups of margarine or sticks of margarine. They make that decision first. And then having made that decision, they choose which brand to buy from. So for instance, in this example, if they chose cups, they could choose from brand cups one, two, or three. If they chose sticks, they could choose brand one or two. In contrast, you can imagine a brand primary market. Now this is where consumers first decide which brand they want to buy from, brand one, two, or three. And then having made that decision, they then decide which form factor cups or sticks to purchase. Now this might seem like a trivial difference, but it's actually quite important to understand how consumers approach this. And it's particularly important for brand three. Because if brand three is sitting there debating whether they should introduce sticks, which you might note does not exist in either of these, well, if consumers approach that decision in the brand primary market form, if they introduce sticks, all they're doing is cannibalizing their own sales. Because consumers have already elected to buy brand three products, and so now they're introducing another product to compete with their own. On the other hand, if people are in the form primary market, well, brand three doesn't exist in sticks. So when consumers decide to buy a stick, Brand 3 isn't even in the consideration set for purchase, meaning they could introduce their product there without risk of cannibalization. So this is another way to describe a marketplace. We're not making causal statements, but we're making a descriptive statement. And we might want to ask the question, well, how would you figure this out? Because I'd venture you can't really ask people, because I, I know I have no idea how I choose margarine. I just make a choice. But it, ultimately, I do make one of these decisions. I just don't know what it is. So if you ask me explicitly, it would be very hard for me to tell you. So let me propose one option. What about a stock out? What if you artificially create a stock out of, let's say, brand one's cups? Well, presumably customers would come to the store, brand one cups would not be available, and they'd make a choice about buying something else. 
would they then go choose brand 2's cups, or would they switch to brand 1's sticks? If you saw an increase in relative market share of either of those two in the presence of a stock out, you could begin to conclude which one of these two form factors customers are actually engaging in when they make this decision. So again, this is just another example of describing a competitive environment in the context of how consumers think about this. In a case you think this margin thing is kind of crazy, think about a more common environment, like buying cars. Does someone first say, I want to go buy a BMW, and they choose which particular model BMW? Or do they first say, I want to go buy an SUV, and then decide which brand within SUVs? This is a very common way for people to approach different product decisions. Are they choosing the form factor? Do I want a laptop or a desktop? Or are they choosing a brand first, an Apple or a Dell? And depending on which one of those people are engaging in, you could imagine very different marketing strategies to attract them to buy your products. Now, the last two pieces, positioning studies and segmentation studies, are another great way for us to segment the marketplace, but we're actually going to talk about those at a future date when we talk about cluster analysis as a computational tool to do this automatically for us. So we won't be discussing it here, but stay tuned for the cluster analysis video, which is in a couple of weeks. And the next video is actually going to follow up on this and say not only can we have quantitative data that we can look at and actually conduct statistical analysis on, but can we make causal claims? Like this thing caused something else to occur. Like a change in price caused a change in sales volume. And you will see how that all plays out in the next video.